Happy New Year. I'll return to the seasons with spring and summer later, once we're actually in that time of year. So in the meantime, I thought I'd turn my attention to the other major topic for Waka poetry, love. This was an absolutely crucial subject for reasons which should be obvious. In pre-modern Japan, just as in today's UK and elsewhere, it was and is one of the most important human drives and a source of endless angst, frustration, satisfaction, sadness and despair. You'll note I haven't said joy, which you might expect me to. The reasons for that will become clear later. What I'm going to do in this video is lay some groundwork for the subject with a few remarks on how the nature of pre-modern Japanese poses some problems for the interpretation of waka, and love poetry in particular, and how these can influence the choices a translator, me in this case, needs to make when trying to express the language and sentiments of a waka in English. Then I'll talk about how love affairs and relations between men and women were conducted in Heian, Japan to provide some information on the context in which love poems were written and how they were used. I hope that by providing this background, it will be easier for you to understand the language and imagery used in love poetry when I talk about them later. Let's get started. To start off with, I need to talk a little bit about pre-modern Japanese and my waka translation practices as these have more impact on love poetry, I think, than other topics. Don't worry, I'm not going to go off on an extended discussion of Japanese grammar or use any technical terms, but talking about some of these issues briefly will help, I think. I should say at the outset, though, that some of the things I'm going to talk about relate to challenges in putting waka into English and languages like it, so they're not relevant for languages which have structures which are close to Japanese like Korean, for example. With that being said, one of the key challenges in translating waka and some pre-modern and modern Japanese pro prose is working out who the writer is talking about and how they are identifying themselves at any given point in the text. If you're an English native speaker and don't speak any other languages, I suspect that sounds mad. How, you may be asking yourself, can anything make sense if you don't know who the writer is talking about at any point in the text? It's obvious, isn't it? I mean, take the simple sentence, I go to Tokyo. The fact that you have the word I in it tells you that the speaker is talking about themselves, while the fact that the verb is in the form go reinforces this. Although conceivably the speaker could be saying you, we, they go too. They couldn't, though, be saying he, she goes to Tokyo because the form of the verb is wrong. But think for a minute. What if you had a language where verbs didn't change their form according to who it was that was performing them and just stayed in the same form all the time? Then you wouldn't know whether it was I doing the action, or you, or they, or we, or he, or she, at least not from the verb. But you might counter the pronouns. Words like I, he, she and you would tell you. What, though, if our language didn't use pronouns and, in fact, generally didn't indicate the subject, that is, who was performing the action of a verb, at all. What if it just gave you the verb? So a sentence would be the equivalent of go to Tokyo. You'd have no way of knowing from the grammar of the sentence who it was doing the action. Now, in real life conversational situations, this might not matter because you could get the information from elsewhere. You're talking to someone and have just asked them, what do you do every Saturday? and they've responded, go to Tokyo, then you'd know from the context that they're talking about themselves. In fact, go to Tokyo would be a more natural conversational answer in English, I think, than anything else. What though, if you're presented with a piece of language like this, shorn of any specific context? What you'd have to do is extrapolate from your general knowledge to attempt to work out what it means. The more experience you have, the more likely you are to be right, but it's not definite 100% of the time. Well, it should come as no surprise to you that the linguistic context I'm talking about is Japanese. Japanese verbs don't change their form according to who it is that's doing them. And while the language does have ways of expressing subjects explicitly, often it doesn't. So in modern Japanese, 
Tokyo e iku means I, you, he, she, we, they go to Tokyo. Pre-modern Japanese was just the same. So more often than not in Oaka, you'll just be given the verb without any indication of who is performing the action described. When reading the original poems, this doesn't matter. One just absorbs the meaning and interprets it in one's head. But if translating into English, which expects and indeed requires a clearly expressed subject in most cases, it's a problem. The translator essentially has two choices. To insert subjects based upon his or her intuition about which is most likely, or to find a circumlocution to avoid them. The first strategy runs the risk of overemphasizing the presence of the poet as an active participant in the poem, while the latter can sound overly impersonal and sometimes convoluted to English readers. Neither is ideal, but then there very rarely are ideal translation solutions. In my own practice, I tend to follow the first strategy, and particularly so in love poetry, as it seems to me that in order to convey the emotion, then a personal tone is often necessary. But there are people who would accuse me of imposing English language conventions and perspectives on something which lacks it. If you've done a bit of Japanese, or even put the English sentence, I go to Tokyo, into an online translator, you might have ended up with Tokyo e ikimasu instead of Tokyo e iku. This is because while Japanese verbs don't change their form depending upon who is doing them, they do change according to the relationship between the person speaking and the person they're speaking to. So, crudely put, Tokyo e iku means are you, he, she, we, they go to Tokyo, and my assessment of our relationship is that we are friends, while Tokyo e ikimasu means are you, he, she, we, they go to Tokyo, and my assessment of our relationship is that we are on polite, socially distant terms. There are even more complicated expressions and changes if you're talking about a social superior or about your own actions to someone superior, or in particularly formal public contexts. Pre-modern Japanese used these types of relationship markers too. The technical linguistic term for them is honorifics, which can help in understanding some of its prose texts. But the convention for waka was that honorifics weren't used, partly because they tended to be very long, and so would have disrupted the structure of the poems, and also because one of their functions was to create a distancing effect, and this was felt to be inappropriate for poetry. Socially, waka were one of the few opportunities that existed in the society to address people directly, for all that suggestion and indirection were hallmarks of the waka form. So, to sum up, when you're reading and hearing my translations of the love poems I'm going to talk about, I'd like you to bear in mind that what you're experiencing is my take on them, and that's shaped by my translation practices. It's the same for all of the translations and poems I discuss in these videos, of course, but I think that the impact on love poetry is greater. As a small digression, this brings me to another feature of Waka worth mentioning. If a poem uses no explicit subjects, and its language lacks markers which convey the gender of the person speaking, how do you know what this is? That is, is the poem a man addressing a woman, a woman addressing a man, a man addressing a man, or a woman addressing a woman? The answer, of course, is that you don't know for sure from the poet and poem itself. Sometimes contextual information is presented in the waka's headnote, sent to a lady, for example, or written when a man had failed to call. And if the poet is identified, then you have further clues. But what if the poet is anonymous and the topic is unknown? Then you often have to intuit who is talking to whom from what you know of the social conventions and expectations in pre-modern Japanese courtship and relationships. The situation is also complicated by the fact that it's quite common for poets to compose work speaking with the voice of the other gender. That is, male poets composing poems in the voice of a woman or, more rarely, female poets composing in a man's voice. With that being said, though, there's often a degree of ambiguity and alternative readings could be possible. In my translations, my interpretations tend toward the conventional, that is, assuming that the love being expressed is between a man and a woman, and vice versa, because that's the way the tradition has analysed the poems, and I don't think an introductory talk like this is the place for these sorts of interpretive controversies. As an aside, there's an ongoing research project being done by one of my colleagues in North America, 
to collect and analyse all of the waka from the canon, which are explicitly expressing male-male love. And that's something, the results of which, I'm very much looking forward to reading and hearing about when it's more advanced. Watch this space, is all I can say. With all of this long preamble out of the way, let's get down to the main topic, which is how pre-modern Japanese perceived love and how they expressed it in waka. How you express love for another person differs according to age, sex and, of course, cultural background. And what may be perfectly acceptable and normal behaviour in one cultural, cultural context can be beyond the pale in another. It's also true that customs change over time. I well remember an anecdote told me by one of the Japanese members of staff at SOAS in London while I was doing my doctorate about her grandmother's wedding night. It seems that upon being escorted into the marital bedroom for the first time, she found her new husband, with whom she had barely exchanged two or three words before, this being a traditional miai, an arranged marriage, kneeling formally beside the futon with a piece of paper, a brush and an inkstone before him. He pushed these towards her with a brusque Poi no uta yonde kure, compose me a love poem. And so her first act in married life was to rack her brains for memories of the classical love poems she had learnt at school and cobble together something appropriate together out of the pieces. Now, I have no idea how many new Japanese husbands still ask their wives to do this. Almost none, I suspect. But the exchange of poems between lovers has an extremely long history in Japan. Even in the early, in the 8th century, the great manual poet Otomo no Yakamochi was sending passionate poems to his wife, the elder maiden of Sako no Ue. Asayoi ni mimu toki sae ya oagi moko ga nirido minu goto nao koishi kemu. Dawn and dusk is the time I see, my darling. Yet seeing her as if I've seen her not, how much I do love her. It was also common for lovers to exchange poems when they were due to be parted, as in two of four poems from the time Ichihi, Lord Tabe, was appointed to the Dazaifu. Koromo de ni tori todokori, nakuko ni mo masareru ware o okite ika ni semu. To your sleeve, fast holding, a sobbing child would weep less than I on our parting. What will you do? Okite yukaba, imo koimu kamo, shikitae no, kurukami shikite, nagaki kono yo. Were we to part and I depart, my darling, would you still love me? The folded cloth of your black tresses spread all the long night through. In this context, Ichihi was being posted to the provincial government's headquarters in Kyushu, a long and dangerous journey from the capital in Nara, and one from which he might not return. Kine seems to have been a lady serving at court with whom he was more than close. Her worry and grief at being parted from him is quite rawly expressed, while his reply wonders whether she will, re will remain faithful to him throughout the long period of his posting. By the time of Japan's classical aristocratic age, the Heian period between the 9th and 12th centuries, poetry had assumed an even more important role in relationships. At that time, the only men an aristocratic woman was likely to meet face to face were her father, brothers and husband, unless she was fortunate enough to get a position at court. One of the reasons such positions were so popular with noble women was because they were freed from many of the strictures that confined them at home. They were free to move around inside the palace, take part in the roster of events and celebrations which took place there, and even show their faces in public and meet and talk to men directly. Pse Shonagon, in her Pillow Book, recounts a number of bantering and flirtatious exchanges with male courtiers, and even Murasaki Shikibu, the author of the tale of Genji, who was generally bookish and reserved, relates how Fujiwara no Michinara, the father of the empress and the most powerful man at court, attempted to call on her one evening in her quarters at the palace. Being Murasaki, she refuses to admit him, and he sends her the following poem in the morning. Yomosugura, kui na yori keni naku naku zo, 
まきのとぐちにたたきわびつる。All night long cries the water rail, but even more did I weep and weep again at your cedar door. I knocked, but found only grief. She replies with her own poem. Tada naraji to ba kari tataku kuina yue, akete wa ika ni kuyashi karamashi. It is not so easy, I think, but briefly knocking at my door was a water rail. Opening to it, how deep would be my regret? Both poets refer to a particular bird, the water rail, Quina, whose cry was believed to sound like someone knocking on a door. Of course, the hope that many women, and their families too, had of a position at court was that she would catch the eye of a high ranking aristocrat and a relationship would start. At home, though, any men other than family members would be met through blinds and curtains, and if a woman was from a wealthy and important family, Non family men would only be communicated with through intermediaries. If a man called, the lady would speak to one of her serving women, who would approach the curtains dividing the room and speak to the man on the lady's behalf. The lady herself might not even hear his voice as he spoke to her servant, and he might not even her hear hers as the servant passed on his words. How, then, was a man to impress a lady enough that she might admit him into her bedchamber? And how was a lady to know what a man was like? On what basis could they form a judgment when neither knew what the other looked like, sounded like, or were like? Well, the answer is that there was one means of communication open to them writing, and more specifically, writing love poetry. A man would write a poem to a lady, and if she liked the sentiments of the poem, the look of his handwriting, his choice of paper, And her servants reported favourably on the appearance of the servant who delivered it, she might write back. On receiving her reply, the man would assess it in the same way and decide whether he wanted to continue pursuing her. If the lady was unwilling or shy, but her serving woman deemed the man a good one, they might write back on her behalf, and more than one Heian lady was surprised to find herself suddenly in the company of a man who had been admitted by one of her servants. Although, with that being said, the existing textual evidence suggests that even in those situations, a man would generally not force himself on a woman if she was unwilling. Interestingly enough, the best strategy for a lady in those circumstances seems to have been to be completely cold and unresponsive to the man, to ignore him completely, engaging him in conversation, or even worse, getting upset and appearing vulnerable, were more likely to be taken as indications of permission to proceed. In any case, the vital role that poetry played in relations between men and women accounts for its importance as a topic for poetic composition. Poetically, a relationship was expected to go through five distinct stages anticipation, consummation, satiation, desperation, and separation. So you get poems yearning for a lover who doesn't even know you exist. Poems of sadness after a relationship has been consummated, but the lovers have to spend time apart. Poems of affection between lovers who are close to each other. And poems of grief when a lover has turned cold and either refuses another meeting, if a lady, or fails to come visiting, if a man. Finally, there are poems railing against a lover who has moved on, when the relationship is over and done. I'll go through, through some examples of all of these and more. In the next video. A tryst was expected to be carried out according to detailed rules of etiquette. The man had to arrive after dark, but he should not keep the lady waiting too long. If he did, he might find that another man had got there before him. After admittance to her house, he might play music, usually a flute, fue, while the lady accompanied him on the koto, a stringed instrument resembling a zither. Next, he might be permitted to approach close to her curtains, while she approached him from the other side, and they would converse directly. It was then understood that, at some point, he would thrust the curtains aside and the two would become lovers. This might be the first time the pair had ever seen each other, and thus, in classical texts, including waka, 
müde, see, almost always means sleep with when referring to a man seeing a woman. After spending the night together, buried under their kimono, the other kinds of bed covering didn't start to be used until much later, the man had to be up and depart before dawn, before the rest of the household was officially awake. His first task, on returning to his own residence, was to write a morning-after poem, usually about how his sleeves had got soaked with dew, that is, tears, on his way home. This was an anxious period for the lady, for until his poem arrived, she didn't know how serious the man was, and if it came tardily, or not at all, well, that would be dreadful. Once the man's poem came, she would reply, usually along the lines of how she grieved about how brief their time was together, and how she would seek to dream of his face while they were apart. Of course, if she didn't think much of him, she would reply late, or not at all. If you think about it, it's not that different from the complicated and unwritten rules about texting that govern relationships in many 21st century societies. How often should you text someone you're interested in? How long should you wait to reply to a text you've received? What should you text about? How long should your texts be? From the number of blogs, articles and TikToks that I've seen picking over these questions, it's clear that getting your answer to any of them wrong is a relationship faux pas. The type of written communication may vary, but the underlying emotions of people dating today and lovers back in Heian, Japan, don't seem to be all that different. Getting back to Heian, Japan, the nights that lovers spent together would usually be taking place in the lady's parents' house and frequently with their connivance, if they approved of the man. If they did not, then they might post guards or take other steps to keep him out. There are any number of sorrowful poems by men whose access to their lovers has been severed by disapproving parents. Once a man had spent three consecutive nights with a lady and both parties agreed, the pair would be considered married. There was no religious ceremony equivalent to a wedding. The Shinto ceremony used in Japan today was invented in the early 20th century for the wedding of the Taisho Emperor. And the man might then be allowed to stay on past dawn if he was lucky. It may seem a strange way to carry on relationships, but it lasted for several hundred years. And though there was much grief and jealousy, unavoidable when the system expected that one man would have a, pr a principal wife, whose family would provide him with economic and political support, with such usings often being a matter of negotiation between the couple's parents, um, and a number of secondary wives in different locations and visit them. There was also much joy and passion, and through reading the poems these people have left behind, you can form a connection with them as human beings, despite their living a thousand years ago in a society which is alien to us in almost every respect. That's it for this video. In the next one, I'll talk in more detail about the specific types of images and language which were used in Waka love poetry. But if you can't wait until then, check out the translations on my website. There's over 6,000 translated poems there, covering the entire range of poetic topics. And you can even subscribe to my mailing list to get a weekly dose of poetry. I'll leave the final word to Izumi Shikibu, perhaps Japan's greatest ever female poet, and a beautiful poem which I love for its simple description of a single tender moment between two lovers. Topic unknown. Kuro kami no midarete shirazu uchi fuseba mazu kaki yarishi hitozo koishiki. My black hair in disarray, uncaring he lay down and first gently smoothed it, my darling love.